So we're going to walk through uh, queuing and running jobs. So mirrors uh, queues are broken up into three parts. There's prod long, which is restricted to that first row at the top of the machine. And then prod short and prod capability, which can run any, any jobs in those queues can run anywhere on the system. Um, we do our best to make sure that the documentation that we've got online is uh, up to date and current. The thing to kind of look for in general is that um, we will allow you up to a max running uh, five jobs per user, and you can have about 10 and 20 jobs queued at any time. Uh, this means that if you've got a very large series of jobs, um, you may need to look into workflow software such as uh, Fireworks as a way of managing those jobs or some sort of custom scripting. Uh, what do those jobs actually mean? Well, for our uh, for prod, um, essentially you must be a valid insight or a, a valid project with a positive balance. Um, these are jobs that use between the smallest of the uh, underlying uh, queues price short. Well, is for, it will give you between 512 and 4,096 nodes. Again, um, the smallest partition you can have on Mira is uh, 512 nodes, hence the minimum queue size is 512. Um, Pride short is jobs short equal up to or shorter than six hours. Um, I'm actually going to jump over Pride long and go to Pride capability, which is anything from 4K, so 4,097. Uh, nodes are greater up to a full machine size. Prod long is kind of um, our point of the, it, it gets picked on a lot, um, but it is for jobs so that are sub capability size, so smaller than 4,096 4, nodes or smaller um, that are using uh, greater than six hours. Uh, in terms of priority, we always favor prod capability. Um, Anything you can do to get into the capability queue, bundling jobs, um, occasionally sacrificing efficiency for uh, going up in size, um, it, it will pay off. Um, scaling pays. So we, again, if you have a 512 node job and it takes forever to run, it probably will continue to take forever to run. However, if you have an 8K or larger job that is struggling to run, we will help it out. Um, there is a backfill queue that's for, your, for, for projects that have gone into the negative. Um, backfill require, receives no priority, but can run um, from 512 nodes and up for up to six hours. And then there's, earlier Ray had mentioned the magical five-dimensional torus, which is impossible to visualize unless you're, I guess, from Berkeley. And in order to make wiring, well, in order to be able to make job packing a little more efficient, um, the, the 1024 tori is not a true torus in all five dimensions. It is a mesh, I believe, in the D dimension, um, such that they can pat, put one rack job side by side. If you need the full torus in all dimensions, then there are separate queues uh, for prod 1024 torus. Similarly, in order to create a larger number of uh, 32K partitions and enable, uh, again, slightly better packing, um, there is a separate prod 32768 torus, which is a torus in all dimensions. Um, CETUS, things are a little bit uh, easier to explain. Uh, the, max, the biggest thing to watch out for is the maximum wall clock time on CETUS is an hour. Um, again, this is to kind of push people to reserve CETUS for um, testing and development runs. The one, the one exception is there is a prod queue on CETUS, so, but that is a special cases queue. So again, the vast majority of users, 99.8% of users, um, are limited to an hour. However, if you or your PI get stuck on something, say 
um, calculating, say, a waveform function, or there's some sort of decomposition that just due to the laws of physics will not scale and is blocking your ability to run, say, a larger simulation, um, then feel free to reach out to your catalyst or to support ALCF.analyst.gov, and we'll work with you to figure out if uh, ride capability becomes a little more important. Um, everything, by the way, on CETUS matches what's on Mira, so it's all the same software, you're mounting all the same file systems. So again, um, if it's short, under an hour, and it looks like it's something that might back up or take a while to get through on Mira that you just need for testing, run it on CETUS. Um, Vesta has its own file systems. It's a separate, it's a separate entity. Um, for the longest time, I referred to Vesta as kind of like our open mic night. Um, it was a place that was open to just about anyone, um, ranging from high school students to um, folks who had never seen a blue gene before or never scaled before. And so it's got a slightly longer wall clock time at two hours. Um, and that's really, again, meant to discourage people from using Vesta for too much that's production oriented, um, but to allow them to be able to do serious debugging and scaling sessions in preparation uh, for putting in an ALCC or an insight proposal. Uh, one thing to think about is uh, there's a term tabula rasa or clean slate. Um, as Ray mentioned earlier, we don't run Linux, we run CNK. CNK is a single user operating system. Every time you submit a job and a job begins to run on a blue gene system, you get a clean slate, tabula rasa. Um, the nodes are being completely rebooted. There's nothing left in memory. Uh, the network is actually completely reprogrammed for you um, to your specifications. There is absolutely nothing left in time. The flip side of this, the disadvantage, is that you have to be a little bit patient and take into account boot times. So it can take between up to seven minutes to boot the full machine. And as on average, it's usually between one and three minutes. Um, where this also becomes important is as you're running larger jobs in order to keep you from having to requeue if something goes wrong on boot, um, our scheduler Cobalt will attempt to boot things three times. So when you're calculating job lengths, you want to work in maximum boot times. So if you have, say, a full system job that lasts an hour, you will actually want to make sure that you've actually added in maybe an hour, made it an hour and a half to accommodate uh, the possibility of reboots. Um, so is anyone here familiar with PBS or um, Torque, Maui, or run on uh, any, of, uh, any of the NASA systems that use PBS Pro? Well, Cobalt, is very, very similar to those systems um, in that they follow, there is a standard that uh, POSIX spit out. The only scheduler on the market that does not have POSIX interfaces is uh, Slurm. Um, just about all these commands should be very, very familiar just to run through them. Um, there's QSUB, which uh, will submit a job. First, I should turn off in caps lock. Um, QSTAT which will show you a queue in the queue status, what's running, what's queued. Um, QDEL, which will delete a job. Once the, uh, that, and by the way, it'll only delete your jobs unless um, Q, you've actually added members of your project or group um, as someone who can modify jobs. There's QAlter to alter uh, batch job and parameters. And we'll go through these again in a minute. Um, QMove. To move jobs between queues, queue hold uh, to place running jobs on hold, well, non-running jobs on hold. So say um, you were counting on a file transfer from another site to finish, or you discovered a problem with your binary in another run, you can place um, jobs on hold that way. QRLS or queue release, which uh, releases jobs that which are on hold. 
And then there's queue available, queue avail, which will list uh, current backfill slots available for a particular partition size. So say you just want to get something in while the system is draining for a larger job, you can uh, use queue avail and see what's possibly out there. Um, the other two commands to kind of keep in mind are show res, uh, show current and uh, future reservations. Uh, about every two weeks, we get an email asking why jobs aren't running. And the general answer comes back, well, it's because there's a system-wide reservation or the system is in maintenance. Um, and so show res will show you those reservations when they're coming up and what partitions and users are on them. And then there is user res, which um, is kind of strangely named, but it will release a reservation so that way other users can uh, so say I've asked for 12 hours for a reservation for some scaling. I'm not going to use it, it use my full 12 hours. Um, I can release my reservation and other users can go on to use the machine. Um, any questions so far? Awesome. Um, it, either you guys are the fastest learners I've ever had or um, I, and I am rocking it, or we'll find out in a little bit that uh, things were broken. So QSub has a lot of options, and these, some of these are blue gene specific. Um, the options that you need to watch out for, um, just to kind of run down the standard options, and this is, again, um, all these uh, commands have man pages on the system, and they're documented um, in our user guide. But um, the big ones are dash capital A for project. So what are you charging? Dash Q for Q. You don't have to choose a Q um, from Mira or any of our systems. If you just Q sub, it will um, look at the job parameters and your project and will try to route things accordingly. Um, but sometimes if you've got a reservation, reservations have their own queues. So you'll want to specify a reservation queue or use Q move to move things um, from a general queue into um, the reservation queue. Uh, dash T, um, you can do time in minutes or you can do hour, colon, minute, colon, seconds, um, either way. Uh, dash N, number of nodes, and that's the number of nodes that you're going to uh, to run on. One thing to, again, if you ask for fewer nodes than are within a partition, you will still wind up on the same number of nodes as the next partition size up. So say if I'm on Mira, I ask for one node, I will get 512 uh, nodes. Um, I will still run on one node, but I will get 512. Um, there's dash dash proc count, which uh, think of that as the number of cores available. Uh, so maybe I have, a, and I'll jump forward to mode. So um, again, Ray earlier mentioned that there's the concept of mode, which in hardware decides how many cores and how much memory per core is available. So basically it's taking that hardware node and partitioning it. Proc count is kind of like setting the number of, saying the number of cores that are in use. So even if I have chosen say C64, and a high number of cores, I don't have to use all the cores that I've requested. Uh, dash daf env, env for passing forward environment variables. The next piece down, uh, the other mode to think about um, is script. So all of these options you can put into a bash script and uh, use the bash script as a way of um, recording com incoming variables. Um, there's the command, which can be either the binary on the blue gene, or it can be the script file if you specified mode dash dash script. Uh, dash capital O to specify the output file prefix. Um, it defaults to job ID dot um, output and job ID dot error. I believe you can also redirect the error. Um, dash M to send email on job start and end. Uh, one that's also kind of imp important is dash dash dependencies. So you can set uh, dependencies on other jobs that are in queue. 
So if you've got a situation where uh, job 100 and job 102 must finish before job 104, um, you can set dependencies for job 104 on 101 uh, on 100 and 102. So that way you can be sure that things run in the order that you intended. Um, if a job exits with a non-zero exit code, the dependency will uh, will not be uh, met. It'll just be held, and you'll manually have to go in and either release the release or change the dependency. And then there's a dash capital I uh, for an interactive command. Um, again, you cannot log into the BlueGene compute nodes. Instead, you find yourself on a shell um, on a login host, but a partition has been assigned to you, which then you can use the run job command uh, to run things on. Um, any questions so far? Cool. Um, I promise I'll also stop reading to you guys and bang on keys and maybe in a minute or two. Um, so again, we kind of went through the start of proc count and mode. So again, mode C1, you've got one rank per node, but you can use all the threads. Mode C2, two ranks per node. So half one rank can see half the cores and half the memory, and the other rank can see the other half the cores and half the memory on each node. Um, and this continues up through um, C16, where you wind up with one rank per core, but that one rank uh, that one rank can see one sixteenth, so one gigabyte of the memory. It, but it can still run up to four hardware threads on that core. C32, we've got two ranks per core, and C64, we wind up with four ranks uh, per core. Um, you can then use proc count to adjust the number of overall threads, or if you're using OpenMP threading um, you, in any of the modes, you can use OMP num threads to say how many of the har available hardware threads you're going to use. So in mode C1, you could do OMP num thread 64, uh, mode C16, OMP num threads 4. By the time you get up to C mode C64, the only valid number of OMP, th number, OMP num threads is 1, because uh, all of your hardware cores have been uh, subdivided. So I had also mentioned script jobs. One so rather than specifying dash dash mode C something um, followed by the binary, instead you wind up with dash dash mode script and then the script name. And uh, it's a bash script. After the shebang, that first line that says, you know, hash bang slash bin sh or slash bin bash. Immediately after that line, you can add COBOL directives. Um, so there's a kind of an example of that at the towards the bottom. But then instead of having MPI run, you have run job uh, to be able to actually launch uh, launch jobs. And the important part and parts there are uh, run job dash dash np the number of MPI ranks dash lowercase p the number of ranks per node uh, dash dash block dollar sign, cobalt, all capital letters, cobalt underscore part name. And then you have to have a colon, um, the path to your executable, and then any sort of args, uh, arguments uh, to that executable. Uh, there is a run job man page, and there's further documentation available. Uh, a lot of our users use script jobs just because it's a lot more convenient uh, to be able to stage things, copy things around, redirect input and output. Um, accordingly, again, Laurie kind of mentioned job dependencies, making sure that if you've got things that must occur in a sequence, again, job one, making sure that 102 follows job 100, which follow with, with 104 following, you can set dependencies and create chains. Um, one other nice thing about that chains on Mira is a certain percentage of a job score or its priority when you use uh, depth chains are inherited from one job to the next and within a dependency chain. So it's, again, in your best interest if you're going to have long-running campaigns um, where things will require more than 24 hours and come up on, on each other 
um, it's in your best interest to arrange those dependent jobs and those long campaigns within a depth chain. Um, again, there's safety. So say we had in this case job three, uh, 234439 and it fails, it ends with a non-zero exit code. Um, the dependent job 234440 will go into depth fail. And then using QRLS, the same command that you would use to release other holds, uh, release a user hold, you can use to release a dependency hold so that the dependent job 234440 uh, continues on its way. Um, we're not really going to go into too depth with it, but also within script mode, it's possible to have multiple consecutive runs within a single job, uh, multiple simultaneous runs in a single job, combinations of the both. Um, a lot of this feeds into what's referred to as arranging ensemble jobs. So say you're doing something like a material, like a parameter sweep, where you don't have jobs that rise to um, an 8K partition or larger in size, you have, say, a ton of 512 node jobs. You can arrange those to all, you can bundle them together in an ensemble such that all those 512 node runs occur at the same time within a capability sized uh, partition. Um, we're not going to go into that, but there, and there's plenty of resources um, within our user guide. And um, again, your Catalyst or anyone at support.alcf.nl.gov uh, can provide uh, advice and uh, example scripts. So in, in, in the case that uh, they're showing, uh, they've taken a 512 node partition and they've broken up into four 128s, or they've taken a 1024 and broken up into uh, two 512s. You can take a 4096, break it up into 2048s. But again, the, usually what folks are doing is they're bundling together sub capability jobs to create uh, capability jobs. So, we had mentioned earlier that we're on a five-dimensional torus. Uh, so rather than mentioning that dimensions are X, Y, Z, um, we use uh, a mapping which is referred to as A, B, C, E, D, T, where A, B, C, D, and E are five-dimensional torus coordinates, and T is a uh, CPU uh, number within the block. The rightmost letter of that mapping increases first, so T, then E, then D, then C, then B, then A. So if that mapping doesn't work for you because you have that it needs certain proximity, um, you have certain spacing that you require um, just because maybe you've got like an agent model where certain agents are performing certain tasks and they don't want to live next to each other, um, you can actually change the mapping with uh, the run job underscore mapping environment variable. Um, and again, it's going to go from right to left. So in the with the mapping string, they got B, then C, then A, then D, then E, then T. Um, though that mapping has to match partition mapping. So um, you cannot ex overextend in a given direction. And this means that for partition, um, there are different mappings and different layouts possible, uh, depending on the geometry of that underlying partition. Towards that end, um, it is possible to create custom mapping and within a, what's referred to as a mapping file. Um, within the mapping file, instead of specifying the um, a, B, C, D, E, T, layout you supply a, a file name uh, that contains six coordinates and that line by line by line by line and with each row within the file and it, with each coordinate uh, location within the file specifying what task one is up there. Uh, it's a little bit drawn out, but some user in the majority of users don't do any specific mapping. Um, however, again, some projects do have geometry sensitive options. Um, 
and you make heavy use of them. Um, any questions so far? I know there's been some relatively heavy topics. Okay. Um, again, mentioned uh, show res and user res earlier. Um, you can request reservations, which are exclusive use of a partition for a specified group of users for a specific period of time. Um, when you ha when you request a reservation, those nodes are yours. Uh, only your user, only the user specified may access those partitions. They a reservation may exceed our standard wall clock time limit of 24 hours. Um, it may be shorter. Usually, what people are looking for in terms of reservation when users request reservations, it's because there's some sort of debugging that um, is very highly involved and requires coordination with, outside, with um, other project personnel and staff. Or occasionally we will grant reservations if there is some sort of very urgent scientific deadline, uh, say like the editors of Nature or uh, Cell or something come back to you and go, you know, we need these revisions in 24 hours and you just aren't able to make it through the queue. Um, reservations, again, should be the absolute exception and not the rule. Um, when requesting reservations, um, there is a form that should be, that has to be filled out. It should, even if it's urgent, you know, it should be about, if you think you're going to need the reservation, put in the request. Uh, there is a strict five business day lead time requested, and that five business days gives operations time to make sure that um, there will be hardware available, that any sort of other outstanding requests have been arranged or rearranged to allow people to get through. Um, I cannot emphasize enough, if you think you're going to need the reservation, get it in early. Otherwise, it, it's almost kind of like having one of your undergraduate students come to you the night before and go, can I get a, an extension on this paper or on this project? Um, uh, it, it, it sounds a little harsh, and but again, the more lead time you can give us with requests, or even if you have an upcoming series of paper deadlines, um, working with your catalyst and letting them know what your project and conference and paper deadlines are going to be, um, gives them the ability to interact with the scheduling committee and, you know, take things late and make considerations in advance. Um, so I mentioned earlier that it's possible to uh, add users to a given run so that they can control a job, queue delet, or change parameters. So you can add uh, dat dat dash dash run underscore users with a colon separate list of usernames. So if you're part of like a large collaboration and you're going out of town during the middle of um, a campaign, you can add other users to the job so that way they can step in and, and edit it, well, and edit and control the job. The one other thing to think, you can also add the entire project. So dash dash run underscore project. One important thing to think about is even though um, you've given them in the queue sub permission to change the job parameters and queue del and queue hole, um, it does not give them access to your files. This is part of the reason it's important to, so to try to keep your runs within your project directory and make sure that permissions are appropriately set such that, say, everyone can edit your job scripts and everyone can edit and see both the input and output files within your project, if this is a feature that you're going to be making use of. 